Hello, and welcome to the turbulent cosmic archipelago known as Netherstorm. While I have clearer memories of this zone, I have never particularly been fond of it outside the stark contrast of the ethereal ecodomes. The idea of restoring even a little bit of this warped wasteland was fascinating to me at the time, and it still is. To that end, we're going to do away with Area 52, and shift much of the focus back onto who this zone matters to the most the Ethereals, the Batani, and the Blood Elves. Here's why. For the Ethereals, Netherstorm is of twofold importance, hunting down the Void entity responsible for the destruction of their home and physical bodies, and aiding the Batani in recovering what little they can of their birthplace. For the Batani, Netherstorm was once Farallon, their original spawning grounds before the Old Horde hunted them to near extinction and put it to the torch. And finally, for the Blood Elves, specifically those still loyal to Kael'thas, Netherstorm was meant to be a promised land, a place where they could easily satiate their thirst for magic by simply plucking it from the air itself. But the interests of the first two and the interests of the third have clashed with terrible results, and that is where we come in. Let's get started. Travelling to the far northeastern tip of Blades Edge, we arrive at the edge of Netherstorm to find it isn't connected by land, but by a bridge formed from massive coils of thorny brambles. The top surface has had its thorns clipped for safe passage, and every now and then a deep, loud creak can be heard as the constant subtle shifting of Netherstorm's fractured landmass tries to pull it apart. On our side of the bridge, there is an outpost made up of ethereals from both the Protectorate and the Ethereum, and Batani from the Ashville Enclave. The adventurers meet up with Verisa, Lorlen, Liadrin, and Yurel, who are talking to an ethereal engineer called Merdad. He asks for our help shoring up the outpost's defenses and preparing it to be used as a fallback location should Kael'thas' forces, the Sun Fury, grow bold. We learn through him that the ethereals are studying Netherstorm and helping the Batani recover whatever they can from its crumbling wreckage. They initially came to Outland in pursuit of Dimensius the All-Devouring, the near-godlike void entity that destroyed the ethereal homeworld of Koresh and stripped them of their physical bodies. The trail went cold shortly after they arrived, but they didn't move on, certain that the creature had only gone into stasis. After securing the outpost, Merdad leads us across to Netherstorm proper, further explaining that when his people came across a party of Batani, they struck an immediate bond. Both had lost their homes and an irreplaceable part of themselves, and so the Ethereals felt duty-bound to aid in whatever recovery operations the Batani wished for their desecrated home. They were making good progress with excavations in the Ecodomes, then Kael'thas and his Blood Elves arrived. On cue, we hear the sound of battle, and we rush over the hill to see a much larger settlement under attack from Sun Fury forces. Replacing Area 52, we're going to utilize those ecodomes here for the Ethereal Batani base camp of Stormspire, where the Protectorate and the Ethereum work together with the Ashfall Enclave. Essentially, that means these two islands have kind of swapped places, so our initial quest hub is a mostly regrown chunk of old Farallon being encroached upon by external factors. Thanks to the Ecodomes restoring a measure of habitability to this area, Stormspire is partially made up of Batani structures. The rest of it is prefabricated buildings that resemble the kind of traditional architecture you'd find in the Sultanate of Oman in our real world, leaning into the clearly Middle Eastern inspirations of the Ethereals as more than just mysterious exotic traders. We reach the other side of the spire in time to see Kael'thas arrive, backed by his personal guard, amongst them Commander Pathalion and Captain Sillin Fireheart. The Prince threatens us with destruction if we continue to interfere with their business in Netherstorm. Against him stands Nexus King Salhadar, an Elder Warden Sigvald, representing the combined martial efforts of the Ethereals and Batani in this region. Nexus King Salhadar rebukes Kael'thas, tearing him down for the damage his people recklessly inflict on others, but Kael'thas spurns Salhadar as a hypocrite. You sacrificed the very gods of your world to save your people, but not only did you fail, now you think to judge me? Leadrin interrupts their standoff, demanding answers from the wayward prince. 
Why hasn't he been in contact with their people? Why are they creating such horrific weapons? What in Bellore are they doing in this place? Whilst Bellore just translates to the sun in canon, I'm going to alter it here in that the translation isn't quite that literal. It can refer to the actual sun in context, but when speaking spiritually or in something like Lament of the Highborn, Bellore is more abstract and can be interpreted as the Radiant One. This still refers to the sun, but gives it a deific property. I will go further into this at a later date when it's relevant, but for now, we continue. Kael'thas picks up on the use of Bellore, pointedly asking Leadrin if she really believes in such trite tales. She knows better than to have faith. It is only through control and power that their safety will be secured. Leadrin ignores the needling and asks him again why he hasn't spoken with Silvermoon. Or was he too busy betraying Illidan and dropping indiscriminate bombs? Kael'thas angrily dismisses the supposed Lord of Outland as a neurotic, controlling bastard who cares only about himself. Illidan is so blinded by his fear of the Legion and nightmares of Menethil that he would rather self-destruct than admit weakness. Vash was always the favourite in our little triumvirate, no matter how much my people bled for his endeavours. We were already a fractured, broken people when we followed him to Northrend. And even after losing too many more to the Scourge, he could not even kill that wretched butcher. And what was our reward for dragging his carcass back to this decrepit realm of his? Silence. Disrespect. Starvation. I have a duty to my people and I will not have my efforts stalled by a coward." Kael'thas makes a point of saying that he does not relish destroying others, but he will if they stand in the way of saving his people from oblivion. Another Batani called Elder Timekeeper Voden points out that the Blood Elves' efforts here are only hastening their downfall. The Mana Forges have rendered Netherstorm a ticking time bomb, not just for them, but for all of Outland. This reckless push to feed his people's hunger is a dead end. Kael'thas grimly says that he knows. Everything thus far has been nothing but a stopgap, but that will change soon. He warns us again to stay out of this, and orders Liadrin to return to Silvermoon and reassure their people that salvation will come. Leadrin refuses, angrily stating that their people have been fed a lie of hope for too long, and she will not go back without honest answers. Kael'thas expresses frustration with her, but leaves with a parting statement that all he does is for his people. With the immediate threat gone, the group formally meets Nexus King Salhadar, his right hand commander Amir, Elder Timekeeper Vodan, and Elder Warden Sigvald, Amir's counterpart. Taking the lead for us, Liadrin introduces the group, stating our intent to get answers and put a stop to Kael'thas' operation here. Salhadar explains that they intended to do just that, but their forces have been tied up in keeping Kael'thas distracted at Tempest Keep. They must have gotten under his skin for him to make a personal showing. He explains that the most straightforward way to grind Kael'thas' march to a halt is to shut down the Mana Forges, to which Laurelan asks, isn't he concerned about the Prince's warning? and Salhadar's answer startles the group. Leeching the magic from Outland's shattered remains has hastened its deterioration. There is no destructive force Kael'thas could levy against us that is greater than what he has already set in motion. Urel is horrified, arguing that this cannot be so because there are still societies thriving here. It's their home. But Salhadar responds that they would always have had to abandon Outland in the end as it grew more and more unstable. The Mana Forges significantly sped up its degeneration. When the Ethereals first arrived, Netherstorm was mostly one solid piece and they could still access the ruins of Ashran. One day there was a violent surge in the Mana Storm and they could no longer see it. The size the storm is at now? It's a matter of 20 years at most before it consumes all of Outland rather than the hundreds it would have taken degrading naturally. Things may seem habitable in the other regions for now, but over the next few years they will begin to notice signs. 
what elements survive will grow agitated and aggressive. The weather, such that it is, will become unpredictable and wane, and their crops will suffer, growing weak, thin, and more prone to disease. Cousin Gar, Draenor, life's cradle. Whatever you call this world, it died long ago. A fresh corpse may sustain the local scavengers, but the ravages of time do not care for them. The flesh will be stripped, the bones will bleach, and all that will be left is emptiness. Sigvald remarks that stopping the Mana Forges is a matter of duty to the people who still call Outland home, so they might have enough time to leave this broken carcass of a planet at their own pace. Nothing they can do will reverse its effects, short of travelling back in time and preventing the death blow to begin with. Barisa asks if the Sun Fury are aware of what they're doing, and Voden clarifies that whatever Kael'thas is ultimately up to, he is keeping the circle of those in the know very tight. Of his people who have defected and didn't know, all have been horrified to learn what the Forges are actually doing to Outland. Bitterly, Liadrin remarks, They were sold a lie. This was meant to be a promised land, a new home where the pain of our hunger would never dog us again. Salhada, Amir, and Sigvald prepare to leave and continue their efforts deeper in Netherstorm, and while the rest of our group volunteers to go with them and help hold the line at Tempest Keep, the player is asked to work with those left. Before they leave, however, we'd get an optional chance to catch up with Liadrin and Urel, who share what they've been doing while we were busy in Nagrand and Blades Edge. Urel has been doing what she can to help the lower city populace in Shatrath and strengthening ties to the Kuronai in Zangamash. Samara never comes with her to the city, but Burel never pushes her to do so. That pain is something her sister should confront if and only if she chooses to. She expresses appreciation for Liadrin's company through these endeavours, though she worries about the Blood Knight at times. This schism amongst her people is not an easy thing to bear, but Urel comments that there have been many like it in the history of the Draenei, so she will do what she can for Liadrin. Liadrin herself has been thinking a lot about what they saw in Terrakar, and muses about her time as a Priestess of the Light. There was a group that the priesthood viewed as fringe lunatics, primitive sun worshippers clinging to ancient traditions in the same vein as druidism or worse, the reviled, lower-worshipping practices of their hated enemy, the Amani. She looked down on them at the time, thought of them as nothing more than mad fools, but they survived where so many others didn't and she cannot help but wonder if… She stops herself and gruffly tells us that there is work to be done. We're left in the hands of Professor Ikram and Warden Galfrit. Ikram is an ethereal who was a doctor before the destruction of Koresh. She branched out by necessity and now focuses on studying and treating magical afflictions like an arcane plague doctor. Galfrit is a Patani fighter assigned to Ikram as one part protection and three parts assistant, as he found just standing guard in Stormspire unbearably stifling. As they lead us to Stormspire's inn, the Creaking Bramble, Ikram explains who will be helping us with the Mana Forges with the Nexus King gone. The Aldor and the Scryers have their hands full, holding many of the lines our adventures have drawn. In Zangamash, they're helping the Kuranai and the Ashfall Enclave keep the Naga sequestered to Serpent Shrine Cavern, but the snakes keep launching attacks through a labyrinth of underwater tunnels that have proven fatal to all scouts sent into them. They're holding the Shadowmoon Gate from further pushes by Illidan, and mopping up fell orcs that stubbornly cling to Hellfire Citadel, not to mention supporting the Lower City's efforts to cleanse Ockendoon. Needless to say, they can't send much in the ways of battalions, but the Shatar convince them to spare a squad of their best. As in canon, we find these teams at the Town Inn, just with less bickering and jeering and... Can I just say I found it really odd that the Scryers and Aldor are set up in such a way that they are supposed to be working together to eventually form the Shattered Sun Offensive, but if the player works with one group over the other, the other group will straight up kill you, even though your quests are fighting the same enemy. It just feels very at odds with the story. Anyway. The Scryer team consists of intelligence agents, rogues, mages, and archers who combine their skills in shadow magic, illusion, and silent long-ranged killing to strike at their enemies with surgical precision, and they are led by Spymaster Thelodian and Magistrix Lorena. 
Opposite them, the Aldor team consists of ground troops equipped with heavily enchanted armor and supported by battle priests, experienced shock troops trained to attack suddenly, throw the enemy into disarray and move swiftly, and they are led by Anchorite Kaja and Exarch Aurelis. Thelodian tells the adventurer to head to Manaforge Manar, the closest one to Stormspire, and sends his team ahead of us. We see that the storm this region is named after is most concentrated around the Mana Forges, as machinery feeds on the magical guts of a shattered planet. There are pylons set up around the forge to redirect purple lightning bolts, agitated warp energy bleeding in from the twisting nether, as the barrier between Outland and what lurks in the great dark beyond grows thin. Skulking about, we help Thelodian's people sow disorder amongst the Blood Knights standing guard around the forge and recover a personnel roster that allows Thelodian to single out individuals for us to capture and interrogate about the ultimate purpose of the forges. While this is happening, Galfred and Ikram run interference, covertly allowing frightened researchers and labourers to flee. We see Pathelion making his rounds inside the forge, keeping people in line with shame and obligation. Those who falter are accused of wasting the chance they've been given in surviving Menethil's butchery, and he directly asks a wavering researcher if they would prefer to have died with their family instead. They shakily answer no, and Pathelion coldly tells them, There is no room for doubt when our people's future is at stake. Either we keep going, or Arthas may as well have finished us then. He leaves to check on the rest of the forges, and upon interrogating the last engineer, we're told that a man called Overseer Theredis holds the key to shut down the forge, literally. The forges are repurposed technology from Tempest Keep, and use many of the same systems just put to a different end. All they need is the right key. Over the course of this investigation, we learn that the energy Kales people are harvesting has many uses, one of which is to concentrate it into the large blood gems we can see them feeding on to slake their thirst for magic, but the energy is so raw and potent that it only magnifies the hunger, leaving them feeling unstoppable and all but intoxicated when fed with it, but delirious and desperate when without. It's a dead end, as Kael'thas admitted himself, yet he continues to let his people use it, Regardless, we fight Overseer Theridus and shut down the forge, allowing Batani agents to enter the facility and plant seeds to gum up the mechanical workings, ensuring that the Sun Fury cannot easily reactivate it. Returning to Stormspire, we would find Ikram helping the defectors settle in, and she has the adventurer help her by gathering medicinal flowers called ivory bells. Galfred is sent with us because he knows where they grow and what they look like, much to his consternation because his job is to protect her. Ikram reminds him, and also to assist me, so assist if you please. While out gathering, Galfred rambles to us that ivory bells used to grow all over Farallon, and it can be processed into a medicine that manages the symptoms of arcane withdrawal. It's by no means a cure, and it won't sate the thirst for magic, but it can make the experience less debilitating by reducing shakes, seizures, and other uncontrolled muscle spasms. He speaks very fondly of Ikram, her kindness and patience, her intellect and drive, her inventiveness in coming up with this medicine for the elves, and he awkwardly realises how he sounds. He asks the adventurer not to tell Ikram, as he isn't sure how to feel about… well, feeling. The majority of his life was driven by the genosaurs and the echo of the Evergrowth, that constant starving need of the spore mounds to spread and consume. Few of his people have fully acclimated to being individuals, emotionally or psychologically. Fixating on another like this is… new. Finishing up, we return to Stormspire and give the flowers to Ikram. We'd have the option to ask her questions, where she explains the range of symptoms that can come with arcane withdrawal, and what can happen to elves specifically who struggle to stay balanced, showing that she has invested a lot of time and effort into understanding the affliction so she can help those affected by it. Blood Elf players would get a special set of dialogue with her where she gains permission to ask questions for her research, as a wider range of data is always useful for catching outliers. The player can answer her questions in multiple ways, either indicating that they struggle to keep their thirst at bay, or that it doesn't trouble them as much as others, what their worst symptoms are, and if they've ever come close to turning into one of the wretched, all of which Ikram receives with a compassionate bedside manner. 
Afterwards, we head off to deal with Manaforge Koru, using illusionary magic to help the Scryer agents listen in on a conversation happening between Commander Dawnforge and Magister Ardonis, who oversees operations at Koru. There are clear signs of pressure here as Dawnforge demands reinforcements at Manaforge Duro to keep mana raves at bay, drawn in by the intense concentration of power. Ardonis protests, arguing that Duro has more than enough soldiers and should be fine, only for Dawnforge to reveal that the bulk of those soldiers were redirected to Ultras by order of their prince. He only has a skeleton crew. At this, Ardonis expresses frustration, but Pathelion walks in on the conversation, challenging Ardonis' loyalties to their people. We are closer than ever to securing a future for the Sindori, and you would falter now? N no of course not, my lord. Duro will be reinforced at once. We relay this to the Squire agents, who send us back in to shut down the forge the same way as we did Benar. Upon our return to Stormspire, Thelodian and Anchorite Kaja agree to send their forces to investigate Ultras and order us to shut down Duro. While it would be easy to just let it go down in flames, Exarch Aurelis explains that if it were to be destroyed with that much power running through the systems, it would cause an explosion. He isn't sure how bad it would be, but the possibility of blasting the islands of Netherstorm off into the Great Dark Beyond isn't zero, so we are going to want to stop that. It's noted by Magistrix Lorena that Ultras is the most heavily guarded of the forges, with Ara being a close second. Rather than raw magical energy, however, the plume of Ultras is a troubling shade of green. The Blood Elves have had to supplement their hunger through a variety of questionable means, including fell-tainted sources, which accounts for the telling shade their eyes have taken since the fall of Quel'Thalas. She laments that fact, but reinforces the sentiment that she would rather survive than lay down and die out of principle. That doesn't mean wholeheartedly embracing Fel but she's concerned their wayward prince may be doing just that in a desperate attempt to feed them all. She doesn't believe his intent is malicious, but that matters little to the people he hurts along the way. We are sent to take the access crystal from Overseer Athenel, shut down Duro before it can blow, and funnel any survivors for collection by Batani reclamation forces, resulting in another batch of defectors. On our return, we receive news that a Sun Fury Magistral called Theladorn Runewood wishes to defect from Manaforge Ara, enticing our attention with information of critical importance. Upon arrival at Ara, Galfrit notes that there are demons freely wandering the premises, and it's confirmed by meeting Magister Runewood that Kael'thas has entered an alliance with the Burning Legion. Desperation and grief has driven their prince beyond the brink of reason. Illidan promised he would show them how to sate their thirst with demons, only to take that hanging carrot, the hope of salvation for all Sindori, and gave it only to those who pledged absolute loyalty to him and him alone, those who became demon hunters. He lied and manipulated and dismissed. Theladorn shakes his head. It doesn't excuse turning to the Legion, but the situation infuriates him. It didn't have to be like this. Nonetheless, he points us at Overseer Azerad, the Wrath Guard running this forge, and tells us to gather orders sealed by Kael'thas, proving his allegiance. While we shut down the forge, the Magister helps the miners being forced to work beneath the forge escape in droves through a portal that drops them outside Stormspire, which we also escape through with him. We bring the evidence to Thelodian, who immediately has us put in contact with Shatrath, including Kadgar, Adal, Vorenthal, and High Priestess Ishana of the Aldor. They order us to cease operations at Ultras while they send reinforcements to help the assault on Tempest Keep. When Exarch Aurelis asks about the logistics, Tyrion steps into view, explaining that the reinforcements are from Azeroth. The Horde and the Alliance have sent some of their more amiable soldiers to work together. We head to Ultras to find it entirely run by demons and completely loyal Blood Elves. Creating distractions outside, we get inside, kill the Demon Overseer, and shut it down, escaping to the Tempest Forward Camp, where the Nexus King and Vodan's forces are attempting to break into the keep. We relay everything to our friends, and Liadrin is outraged, vowing to put an end to this farce before it destroys what's left of her people. Thankfully, we don't have to wait long before Khadgar arrives through a portal from Shatrath, allowing the Azerothian soldiers to reinforce our position immediately. He regrets that he can't stay, as he must return to help Adal keep the city safe, but once they bring down Kael'thas, they will be one step closer to the Betrayer himself. After Khadgar leaves, Salhadar takes stock of the extra soldiers and admits that brute force is not going to get the job done. They need a key. 
Commander Amir approaches with a hooded blood elf man in tow called Thalen Songweaver, remarking that they may just have one. I finished questioning the one we found skulking about earlier. He seems genuine. A prince has grown short-sighted in his desperation and it is costing all of us. Thalen tells us he was a systems engineer who helped open Tempest Keep when they first arrived, and he kept track of every time security measures were altered in any way. He can get them into the Mechanar, but he'll need some time to work on access codes for the other wings. The Adrin approaches the man and looks him in the eye, asking him what it is he wants. What does he get out of betraying Kael'thas? He answers her firmly. I want our people to survive as what they are, not as fell adult fodder for the Legion's mad crusade. I want our beautiful kingdom restored and our people fed and thriving. I want to go home and be allowed to mourn my family in peace. We accompany Liadrin, Urel, Laurelin, Verisa, Ikram, Gaufrit, and Amir into the Mechanar wing of Tempest Keep, gutting the engineering core of Kael'thas' forces and allowing non-combatant workers to flee. We see the complex machinery that processes warp energy from the forges into mana cells for easy storage until it's needed for some of the process, and find that among other things, the mana cells can be further refined into high-density power crystals, which, when arranged in the correct configuration, can form the core of a mana bomb. The facility is in a flurry of activity, and it can be observed through security glass that entire pallets of mana cells are being funneled into portals, which Verisa comments on, but there's little we can do from this side of the glass. We can also see Captain Sillen Fireheart overseeing this, disappearing through one of the portals himself. The brutal overseer in charge of crystal manufacturing is Lordis Bright Moon, a Blood Elf man wearing a mechanical suit infused with warp energy, and he replaces the Mechano Lord Capacitor's fight. A glass panel in the suit allows us to see him, and it's clear the exposure has had a calamitous effect on him, both physically and mentally. Violet energy lights his veins, glowing through the ghoulish pallor of his skin, and his eyes appear to have literally burned out, replaced by crackling orbs of bright purple. The fight with him is frantic, as he drains mana cells to keep the group at bay, and screams that he will not allow us to finish what Menethil started, lashing out at Laurelin in particular as a filthy scourge monstrosity, murdering her own again as she did years ago. Once he's down, the group takes a moment to recover, and Verisa checks on Laurelin, but the Dark Ranger stiffly brushes her off, uncomfortable and rattled, reminding her that they're not done here yet. Pressing on, we fight our way to the control center where Pathelion awaits, flanked by demons and his apprentice, Nethermancer Sepethria Bleakthorn. He hands her a metal scroll case and opens a portal, urgently sending her away before we can intervene. Attacking Pathelion, his first health bar goes down easily enough, but at 1% he completely drains the Wrathguard fighting with him and transforms into a Fellblood, bellowing that all shall witness the wrath of the Sindori and weep into the ashes of their loved ones, just as Quel'Thalas did. After he is defeated, Liadrin is left staring at his body, and Urel understands what Liadrin is thinking. She admits to feeling the way he did and that other Draenei felt the same in the wake of the orc's corruption. All that pain festered until it burned them from the inside out, and set fire to everything and everyone around them. There was nothing more you could do. Not unkindly, Leadrin asks Yurel if she believes that when she says it to herself. Yurel smiles sadly. No, but perhaps if I say it enough, one day I will. Liadrin thanks her, and believe the Mechanar in the hands of the Protectorate. Outside, Thalen gives the party the access codes they'll need to open the way to the Botanica. He'll work on getting them access to the Architraz in the meantime. It is here we see the various experiments run by Kale's researchers on plants that could possibly supplement their need for mana by drawing on latent magic in the air and soil, concentrating it into something edible like an arcane crop but the results were mixed or ineffective, leading them to desperate measures including experimentation on Batani, Ethereals, and themselves. 
The first boss, Commander Seranus, attempts to cut us down early, but falls with an apology to Prince Kael'thas on her lips. There are a few defectors here. Where the Mechanar was defended by Sunfury, the Botanica is defended by Kael'thas' elite personal force, the Blood Warders, and they will be all we find going forward. Further in, we find the vast laboratory of High Botanist Freywin, a chamber filled with grow beds for all manner of plants and dissection tables for Batani, captured, sliced open, and taken apart to study what makes them work. Galfrit is understandably horrified and enraged, having thought the victims were taken out by Netherstorm's increasingly volatile wildlife, not captured and brutalized like this. Freywin eagerly expresses curiosity in Galfrit, and throughout the fight he reveals the extent to which his experiments have gone, merging pieces of Batani victims into his own body. He calls upon the plants to animate and attack us, and even transforms into a twisted treant towards the end of the fight. Once he falls, Galfrit stands over him, shaking and breathing heavily, his spear clenched in both hands, ready to impale the High Botanist should he still be alive. When it's clear that he isn't, Ikram gently touches Galfrit's arm and helps him calm down. He thanks her, and Ikram reassures him that they will come back for the bodies to return them to the soil where they belong. Pressing deeper, Galfrit expresses discomfort, describing a growing feeling of unease and despair that doesn't belong to him. But that shouldn't be possible unless... Unless we were to find that at the heart of the Botanica is the last remaining ancient of Farallon, driven mad by the sterilization of their primal homelands, the destruction of the planet, and finally the brutal experimentation inflicted on it by the Blood Elves here. Putting the tortured creature out of its misery, there's a quiet moment where Galfrit kneels at its head and puts a hand on its scarred brow, telling the Ancient that the memory of what once was will not fade. They will remember where they came from and what was lost, and they will survive as seeds waiting for the wildfire, ready to germinate into something new. The Ancient passes with some small shred of peace, and we leave the rest of the Botanica in the hands of the Ashful Enclave. We emerge to find that Thalen has opened the Architraz, but he warns us that the prison has become hostile. The Other Wings lost contact with it a few days ago, and he suspects it has something to do with the Void creature in maximum security. This immediately draws the attention of our ethereal allies, and Salhada demands clarification. Thalen explains what his people learned upon gaining control of the prison systems, that Alaria Windrunner and Turalian Kiriev fought with a void monstrosity deep within the Architraz and weakened it just enough to trap it. That monstrosity is none other than Dimensius the All-Devouring. Now, you might be going, wait, hold on, what was that last name? Kiriev? And yes, in canon, Turalian doesn't have a family name, even though he was apparently born into Lordaeron nobility. But why give him this distinctly Russian-sounding last name? I'll go into more detail in a video I want to get done between finishing Burning Crusade era story and starting Wrath era videos, but because the Barov family exists, along with other Russian or German-sounding characters sprinkled through Lordaeron, the Forsaken, Scarlet Crusade, I decided to make Lordaeron a blend of different Slavic cultures, hence a Lordaeron noble having a last name like Kiriev. Anyway, at Varisa's insistence for more information, he says he can just show her when it's safe. The prison's security systems recorded everything inside. In fact, their first sign something was wrong was losing access to those systems. Salhada remarks that the Void is patient and insidious. The monster was likely influencing those around it for months before this point. We enter the darkened prison and fight through void-afflicted jailers and maddened prisoners, learning more about the tragic circumstances of the Ethereals and fighting some of their own who sided with the Void and joined this attempted jailbreak to save Dimensius from his confinement. With Amir, Ikram, and Nexus King Salhada at our side, we confront the monstrosity that decimated their homeworld and stripped them of their physical bodies. Throughout the fight, Dimensius taunts and threatens, picking at the pain, loss, and guilt Salhada feels for failing to protect his people. But the Nexus King does not waver, using the monster's words to spur him on. When Dimensius is finally brought to low health, Salhada is the one who delivers the killing blow, unleashing the full might of the energy contained by his armor. 
Hear the cries of all you destroyed and wither before them. May the winds of the great dark strip you of all sanity, left only with the echo of your victims, crushing what is left of your miserable spirit into dust for the abyss. Dimentius is engulfed in a storm of magic and torn apart to the screams, howls, and wailing of all who did not survive his attack on Koresh. When he finally dissipates, an exhausted Salhadar states that Elaria and Turalyon must have weakened the beast immensely, or they'd all be dead right now. He is helped to the ground by Amir and Ikram, the latter of which gives him an energy packet to restore some of his strength. Thalen emerges from hiding, showing himself to be capable of some magic. Now that it's safe, he gains access to the prison's security systems and shows the team recordings from what happened here, triggering a cutscene. We see Turalyon breathing heavily, holding his sword aloft. Though his armor is battered, his eyes burn brightly with the light, and not just when he's actively using it. He appears to be infused with the light, but that doesn't seem to be enough as Dimensius bears down on him. The monster is distracted by Elaria fighting fire with fire, lashing at Dementius with the void to slow him down and give Turalyon enough space to avoid attack. He berates this use of the void, telling Elaria that they don't need it, only for Dementius to knock him to the ground. <laughs> Turalyon desperately throws up a protective dome, sweating as the shadows engulf it, teeth and claws boiling out of the darkness and chewing through his reserves. Fearing for Turalyon's life, Elaria grits her teeth and launches herself at Dimensius's back, sinking into his body and immersing herself in the power that gives him life. Whatever it is she does, Dimensius jerks back from Turalyon and shudders, clawing at his own body as if trying to dig her out by force. An explosion of purple light erupts from his chest, and Elaria emerges absolutely covered in oily gore, for lack of a better descriptor falling to her hands and knees to cough and retch. She calls out Turalyon's name and he scrambles to his feet, running to a control panel where he slams a crystal key into place. Dimensius is too disoriented to fight as the prison locks him into stasis, frozen in the middle of the chamber by a glowing force field. Turalyon approaches Elaria, concerned at first, but the longer he looks, the more he sees that much of the gore covering her isn't from Dimensius. Slowly he asks her, what have you done? And reaches for his sword again. Alaria looks up at him with multiple eyes of bright pale violet, her skin a sepulchral shade of indigo as she answers him. What I had to, you were going to die. Turalyon's face darkens taking in her sharpened teeth, her elongated limbs, the spines and barbels, the claws, and the spots of glowing starlight scattered across her skin like freckles. And he swings his blade. <coughs> Alaria lunges to avoid it, telling him that it was the only way they could win, and trying to convince him that she is still herself, but he doesn't listen. Turalyon calls her a fool and an abomination against the light, a mistake he must put out of its misery before it causes any more distress to either him or their son. <coughs> she only strikes back when he finally lands a blow, easily throwing him away from her and we can see them leave respective burning marks on each other. <laughs> Turalyon condemns her again, and seeing no hint of mercy or warmth in his glowing golden eyes, Alaria flees through a void portal. After the cutscene ends, Thalen gives Varisa an old journal they recovered during the takeover of Tempest Keep. Judging by its contents, it was Alaria's, and there is a final entry that appears to have been written after this event. Verisa resists opening it now, because they still have Kael'thas to contend with, and she entrusts Laurelin with it just in case. We leave the Architraz in the care of the Ethereum, and we move on to the final piece of Tempest Keep. With Liadrin, Ural, Verisa, Laurelin, Magister Runewood, the Scryer team, and the Aldor team, Thalen tells us that there is a singular weakness in Kale's elite forces, and that is Lord Iridial Sanguinar. He is known as the Prince's Hammer, and is a paladin of great ferocity and conviction, but his loyalty is bought with fear. 
He wanted to return to Azeroth to reunite with his daughter, whom he had thought lost during the fall, but Kael'thas needed him in Outland, and when he tried to force the issue, the prince gave him an ultimatum. Tell him that Valera can be found in Silvermoon, under the care of Magistrix Lidrine Everwish. As I understand, Everwish is out of the loop, and merely believes she is keeping the girls safe while her father fulfills his duties here. The Bloodwater Guard assigned to her, however, is another matter. He will need to be dealt with. Tell Lord Sanguinar this, and it should remove any compulsion he has not to stab our wayward prince in the back. We make our way to Lord Sanguinar, fighting through his soldiers and leaving him without witnesses. He is ready to fight regardless, unbothered by being outnumbered, and warns that he cannot afford to show mercy. Spymaster Thelodian is the one who informs him about his daughter, and while he is cautious at first, the prospect of reuniting with his child causes him to hand over his security key, which will open every door between the team and Kael'thas. He warns us that the fight ahead will be difficult, and begins to leave, only for Liadrin to demand that he stay and help them make this right. His duty is to his people, to ensure their future prosperity, that is their oath as Blood Knights. He retorts that his duty is to his family, and his daughter is all he has left. Liadrin reminds him that Kael'thas has aligned with the Burning Legion. If they fail to stop him, there won't be a single safe place left on Azeroth for Sanguinar or his daughter. She deserves a safe and stable place to call home, as all their children do after the horrors of the fall. Magistrix Lorena reassures him that one of their agents can get word to Silvermoon and ensure the loyalist stationed with his daughter is taken care of. At his agreement, Lorena leaves with one of the scryers to send them through a portal outside. There are far too many defensive wards layered throughout the eye to safely open one indoors, so she will regroup with us after. Progressing through the rest of the raid, we would encounter the other members of Kael'thas' inner council that in canon served as part of his fight, but are fought here as their own bosses. Each of them display signs of fell corruption, and hold unwavering loyalty to the prince and his goals, seeing the Legion as the only option left to ensure their people will never be threatened again. Magistrix Lorena rejoins us in time to confront Kael'thas in his personal observation chamber, where a cutscene triggers when we enter. We see the group approach Kael'thas as he gazes out at the great dark beyond through a large, stained glass screen, his fell green eyes narrowing when he looks at their reflection. He turns around and laments that it's come to this, chastising Liadrin and Iridiel for their short-sightedness. He demands to know what their plan is. Liadrin steps forward, drawing her sword and stating their intent to stop him from damning their people to a fate worse than death. Kael'thas dismisses this answer. I do not care what happens to me. What is your plan for our people? What is your solution to so confidently stand against mine? Do you have a means to feed our people's hunger, or are you content for them to struggle and scavenge, forever fearful that the next source will be the last they ever find? Do you have a method with which to reignite the Sunwell? Or do you intend to let it languish in ruin, just as our people do in the shadow of our former glory? What is your plan?" This throws Liadrin off balance momentarily, but she answers that there is no certainty to any of what he's doing. The Legion is a force of pure chaos and destruction, nothing more. They're the reason Outland is Outland to begin with, and the reason that the Orcs invaded Azeroth. The Legion are the reason the Scourge exists at all. A grim look crosses the Prince's face. You are right, but the Scourge and the monster that rules it has broken free of their leash. Lord Kil'jaeden sent Illidan to slay that bastard Prince, and though he failed, I will not. The Legion will grant us the power to finally erase that wretched human from the face of Azeroth, and we will be safe at last. Liadrin argues that in joining the Legion, he will make the Blood Elves party to a thousand other falls, a thousand other defilements. They will become to other people as Menethil is to them. She demands him to look at the pain he carries for their people and answer her honestly if that is something he wishes for anyone else, if how he feels about Arthas is how he wants the rest of the innocent people across Azeroth to feel about him when the Legion uses the Sindori to burn it all to ash. 
Kael'thas turns away, staring into the great dog with a look of great conflict on his face. He asks again, Do you have a plan, Matriarch? When Liadrin tells him that they will find another way that doesn't involve damning their people, Kael'thas sighs, his eyes falling shut. He seems racked with doubt, guilt, and regret, but when his eyes snap open, they burn with conviction. For Quel'Thalas. He whirls to face the group, fire leaping from his hands and wreathing him in protective wings as his beloved Phoenix, Alar, coalesces to fight with him. The cutscene ends and the fight with Kael'thas begins. Allah defends his master, keeping him safe from most attacks and calling fiery offspring to harry the team. Throughout the battle, Kael'thas implores us to understand that he cannot better watch his people suffer like that again and that he will pay any price to see their future secured. When he is brought to 5% health, Allah wraps around Kael'thas to take all the damage being thrown at him and cries out. The prince seems to understand Allah's meaning, rejecting it at first, but emotes describe Allah shedding tears of molten gold, and Kael'thas apologizes to the ancient phoenix. I'm sorry, old friend. You have done so much for me. I wouldn't dream of insulting you now. Just as Allah succumbs to our attacks, Kael'thas casts a teleportation spell, whisking himself away to safety while the phoenix darkens and turns to ash, frozen in the protective curl he adopted to keep his master safe. After all that, we regroup at Stormspire where the team tries to figure out what to do next. Liadrin is particularly vexed as they have no way of knowing where Kael'thas went, but she and Lord Sanguina agree that Silvermoon must be warned to increase security on the Isle of Queldanus, if at all possible. Talking to Liadrin, she'd express her frustration more, sympathizing with Kael'thas' reasoning and angry because it feels like their people are still hanging by a thread when she thought they were recovering. Yurel comments that healing such tragedy is often a path strewn with pitfalls, but if they possess the will and the unity to do so, they will make it. Liadrin doubts their unity right now, and Yurel points out that it is her strength of will that ensures that part. Your people need leaders, and right now I am looking at one who will stop at nothing to make sure they do not fall into darkness. They are in good hands. Liadrin thanks her and expresses the need for a drink, to which Yurel agrees. Talking to Verisa and Laurelin, we find that they've read the final entry to Ilaria's journal. It indicates that after the split, Ilaria watched Turalyon leave Outland with a Naru who swallowed him in light. This particular Naru gave her chills, not the warm light Turalyon used to have, but something cold, clinical, and without pity. She vows she will continue to fight the Legion, but she will do it her own way. She apologizes to her sisters for not coming home, and fears the reaction if she did now that she's become this… thing. She describes how difficult it is to keep her old form, that the Void writhes and pushes beneath her skin. She will fight for as long as the Legion exists. She apologizes to Verisa for not being gentler for not knowing how to comfort her as a big sister should, and tells her a sensitive heart is not a weakness. She must keep the compassion that made her so kind as a child. Elaria apologizes to Sylvanas for taking their mother's death out on her, admitting she was wrong to shove the blame and the responsibility of shouldering Larissa's mantle onto her. Thasdora should have been hers. It was meant to defend Quothalas, and now it is lost. The final entry reads, I love you both, and I'm sorry I wasn't better at showing it. Shoulder your burdens well, and walk forever in the warmth of Bellore. Spymaster Thelodian and Anchorite Kaja will bring our findings back to the Shatar, and it's made clear that while Kael'thas is no longer an immediate threat, they must anticipate his next move. For now, their attention can finally return to the Illidari. The
the rest of the zone would be dedicated to helping various ethereal and Batani efforts throughout, with a particular focus on their shared feelings of trauma, losing their homes, and the struggle to find a new identity moving forward. One quest after the main story would involve us helping Galfred as he earnestly tries to figure out how best to show his affection for Ikram, concerned all the while that he will be clumsy and that he doesn't want to make her uncomfortable. Thankfully, it doesn't turn out that way, and Ikram returns his feelings, very much sympathising with his confusion, as the loss of their physical bodies was jarring for the ethereals in more ways than one. Another quest would involve speaking to a very old ethereal at a small cenotaph in Stormspire, who explains that her job is to keep the spiritual practices of her people alive, and to remember what was lost. She would have a slight blocks of incense as she speaks and sits on a prayer mat, telling us about the vast beauty of the ethereal homeworld, how their people lived in synergy with the flow of both magic and nature, and of the proud wild gods of their world, and how in the planet's final hours they sacrificed themselves to empower Salhadar to fight Dimensius. She carries these memories because to do anything less would be disrespectful, and without remembering their history they risk losing sight of themselves. One major story that wasn't explored in the zone plot would be addressed after its completion, where we investigate the remains of Kirinvar village with a small team of Batani and Ethereals. We'd see the same kind of devastation we witnessed at the Cenarian Thicket in Terracar, and learn that six months ago they heard an almighty boom all the way in Stormspire. They only discovered what it was after trying to re-establish contact with the village a week later. There were no resources to investigate further at the time, but with Kael'thas driven out and his forces in retreat, they can figure out if anyone survived. Unfortunately, while there don't appear to be any living survivors, this earlier prototype of the mana bomb has left the village in a state of arrested awareness. Almost every spirit wandering the streets doesn't seem to realize they're dead, with the exception of their leader, Archmage Vargoth, who employs us to help his people move on, which we do. It is only when his people are free that Vargoth himself lets go, leaving us with a quest to inform Khadgar of what happened to them. And finally, I know there is a region in Netherstorm called the Celestial Ridge, where you can find Netherwing dragons along with the characters Jarod, Mace, and Tyree, otherwise known as the blue dragon Tiragosa, the former intended mate of Caligos. Now, you are perfectly welcome to like whatever characters you wish, but I personally do not like Kalik and or really care that much for the Sunwell trilogy manga from which these characters originated. I do not care for the plot point of Alexstrasza's consort, Crassus, taking what energy remained from the Sunwell and turning it into a sentient little fake person called Anvina. What I'm going to end up doing will not suit everyone either, but I'm the one making these videos so I do what I want. Within reason. The point is, none of these characters really exist anymore, at least not in the way they were introduced in canon. If I use them, it'll be in a completely different context. Dark Androthir is about the only one that still exists in my version of events, mostly intact. He still betrayed Quel'Thalas for power by telling Arthas how to bring down Bandinoriel, the impenetrable shield that kept Silvermoon safe from the ravages of war for thousands of years. But how are they going to fix the Sunwell if Anvina doesn't exist? We're just going to have to wait for that, I'm afraid. And with that, we're done with Netherstorm. I'm a little impressed I've gotten this far, but I'm excited to keep going and see where we end up, so thanks for joining me. Shout out to my supporters on Patreon, who are all very handsome people, and a special thanks to my newest patrons, Jono and Gortha. If you're interested in hanging out now and then, I have a Twitch channel where I stream World of Warcraft and a handful of multiplayer games, and I also have a TikTok where I post memes, commentary, and stream clips. Thank you all for watching, don't forget to drink your water, take your medication, treat yourselves kindly, and I will see you next time as we journey to the dark and dour fellscape of Shadowmoon Valley.